Hello friends, today we will be discussing a topic of malignant tumor of kidney with RCC. So before starting, I would like to thank Chandana Shri ma'am for sharing these wonderful notes with us, which are very helpful for quick revision. So without further delay, let's get started. The link for the notes is given in the description below or you can download it from my channel. So what is the classification of malignant tumors of kidney? So most commonly is the renal cell carcinoma. It has various types like the clear cell, papillary cell, chromophobe. Then we have urothelial cell cancer that is transitional cell carcinoma, SCC and adenocarcinoma. Then we have sarcomas, leomyosarcoma, liposarcoma, nephroblastic tumor like Stevens. Then renal cell with the nephroblastic tumor that is PNET or endocrine carcinoma, carcinoid, nephroblastoma, neuroblastoma. Then hematopoietic lymphoid like the lymphoma, leukemia, germ cell tumor like the teratoma, choriocarcinoma and the metastasis or secondaries. Now coming to the RCC that is renal cell carcinoma also known as hypernephroma or Gravitz tumor is 2 to 3 percent of the adult malignancy and is more common in males around two times and sporadic is more common than familial. In familial it is seen with Hippon Hippel Lindau, hereditary papillary RCC, Bird Fog Group Syndrome, P10, PSC, that is tuber sclerosis. And RCC is more commonly seen in second decade and after that. And Wilms is more commonly seen in children. And risk factors is tobacco exposure, obesity, and hypertension. Characteristic features is that it is refractory to cytotoxic therapy, immunogenic, so can be tried with immunotherapy, angiogenic, so can be tried with anti-VHF, VGF factor, and dependence on mTOR pathway, so molecular therapy with everolumus can be tried. Now coming to the subtypes, the most common is the clear cell, which is associated with von hippel lindau and the histopathology shows well circumscribed lobulated and golden yellow tissue with necrosis hemorrhage and cystic degeneration it has bad prognosis and sometimes it responds better to VEGFR and checkpoint inhibitors interleukin 2 inhibitors papillary RCC has better prognosis and it shows fleshy tumor fibrous with fibrous pseudocapsule Necrosis and hemorrhage is common and it shows multicentricity. Chromophobe also has better prognosis and histopathologically, grossly, it shows well circumscribed homogeneous and tan brown tissue with perinuclear halo in the histopathology. Others, like carcinoma of the collecting duct of the Bellini, has poor prognosis. Renal medullary is seen with patients with sickle cell and sarcomatoid they are aggressive with metastatic behavior and unclassified have the poor prognosis so how do these patients present most commonly it is incidental finding on examination of ultrasound or ct and sometimes there could be localized a local advanced disease presenting with the too late triad presenting as abdominal mass flank pain and hematuria can also be perinephric hematoma then there could be possibility of obstruction of the IVC causing bilateral lower limb edema and non-reducing varicocele or right side varicocele symptoms of systematic disease which could be in the form of persistent cough bone pain constitutional symptoms weight loss now seeing some of the perineoplastic syndrome associated with it which is seen in around 10 to 20 percent cases uh, it was known as internist tumor due to predominance of systemic finding more than the local manifestation and is more common in the metastatic disease. Treatment mainly is the surgical excision or with antineoplastic medicines. Most common perineoplastic syndrome is raised ESR. And next is the hypercalcemia, which is due to overproduction of 125-dihydroxycholecalciferol and osteolytic metastatic bone involvement symptoms of anorexia nausea vomiting fatigue and de decreased deep tendon reflex 
So how is it managed? It is managed by vigorous hydration, IV fluids, followed by diuresis with furosemoid. Medications which are helpful are bisphosphonate like zolendronate, 4 mg IV, 4 times a week with corticosteroids and calcitonin. Then denosumab, nephrectomy, metastatectomy and focused radiation therapy can be helpful. Hypertension which is due to renin production by tumor. Compression encasement of the renal artery. AV fistula within the tumor, polycythemia, hypercalcemia, ureteral obstruction, increased ICP in the CNS meds. These are the causes. Then polycythemia, which is due to increased erythropoietin by the tumor cell and adjacent cell in response to hypoxia. Then we have stopper syndrome, which is seen in around 3 to 20% cases, which is non metastatic hepatic dysfunction due to tumor cytokines. It resolves 70% of the time after the surgery, nephrectomy, and it shows in the form of increased ALP, decreased albumin, increased bilirubin, increased prothrombin, and decreased thrombocytopenia, neutropenia. HP is non specific with hepatitis or necrosis, and some others like the Cushing syndrome, hyperglycemia, galactoria, my neuromyopathy, cerebellar ataxia, clotting disorder can also be found. Screening should be done for ESRD, von Eppel Lindau's disease, and ADPKD, and other familial syndrome like the tuberous sclerosis. Diagnosis is mainly with DCT and selective use of MRI. In CT, we can see perinephric fat stranding, distant enhancing soft tissue density, adrenal involvement, enlarged hilar or retroperitoneal nodes, renal vein tumor thrombosis. CT is around 78% sensitive and for IVC involvement it is 96% sensitive. MRI shows better tumor thrombosis and retroperitoneal node and for cephalic extent of IVC thrombus we go for transesophageal echo. Then chest x-ray and CT thorax if required, bone scan for patient with bone pain or increased ALP, PET scan if required for distant meds and uh, although we hear CECT is the investigation of choice, we can go for initial imaging in the form of ultrasound abdomen or in ultrasound KUV and uh, apart from that the blood and the urine examination blood examination for the preoperative workup and urine examination for any chances of malignant cells which can be helpful. Then adverse prognostic factors most importantly is the pathological stage, the histological factor, the clinical factors which are associated is poor performance score systematic symptoms like the anemia, hypercalcemia, increased LDH, ESR, CRP, ALP and thrombocytosis. Anatomic could be large tumor, venous involvement, extension into the surrounding organ like the adrenal, lymph node meds, distant meds and lastly the histologic that is the pathological staging, increased nuclear grade, sacromatoid features, histological tumor necrosis, vascular invasion, perirenal fat involvement, collecting system involvement and positive margin. So these are the main factors which are prognostic factors and if they are involved then considering poor prognosis. Now coming to staging, the TNM staging in T1 it is divided into A and B. So T1A is less than 4 cm, T1B is 4 to 7 cm and T2A is 7 to 10 cm. T2B is more than 10 cm. T1, T2 both they will be confined to kidney, not involving outside. In T3, there will be involvement of the veins and the perinephric fat. In T3A, the renal vein or segmental vein branches will be involved with pelvic LSL system or perirenal fat involvement. T3B is infradiaphragmatic IVC involvement and T3C is supradiaphragmatic IVC involvement. 
so here the tumor does not go beyond gerota's fascia 24 where the tumor invades gerota's fascia and can in, so involve adrenal gland n1 is regional node involvement m1 is distant meds now see in the stage grouping where t1 is stage 1 t2 is stage 2 t3 or n1 is stage 3 and t4 and m1 is stage 4 option staging is not used nowadays now coming to the management as per the AUA guidelines for the case of localized RCC evaluation will be cross-sectional imaging very importantly the workup urine analysis CBC metastatic workup if required assigning CKD stage GFR and protein urea renal biopsy is not always indicated indicated when the mass is suspected to be hematological metastatic or having infection multiple core biopsy are better than epine and is not necessary in young patients where surgery is anyway possible and is not necessary in old frail patients where there is no surgery possible active surveillance is the option for initial management in patients with renal mass suspicious for cancer and less than 3 cm ideally 2 cm so means repeat imaging in 3 to 6 months to look for interval growth and if required biopsy and it is preferred in cases with elderly patients with life expectancy less than 5 years more comorbidity and perioperative risk poor prognostic score poor patient performance then marginal renal function so in cases with tumor less than 3 cm growth less than less than 5 mm per year non infiltrative favorable histology these cases we can do active surveillance then thermal ablation through percutaneous ablation through radio frequency or cryo here we will need biopsy before going for thermal ablation indication is tumor size less than 3 cm that is t1a then we can go for partial nephrectomy which is mainly for t1a tumors and is debatable for t1b and t2 tumors goal is preservation of renal function also known as nephron sparing approach so anatomic and functional solitary kidney bilateral tumor familial rcc considering tumor enucleation pre-existing ckd proteinuria young patient with multifocal masses with comorbidities so in these cases we have to preserve renal function so we can go for partial nephrectomy or nephron sparing surgery functional nephron remnant of at least 20 to 30 percent of one kidney is necessary to avoid end-stage renal disease so that much has to be preserved procedure here we go for temporary occlusion of the vascular pedicle to avoid prolonged warm ischemia tumor excision with rim of normal parenchyma closure of the collecting system and ligation of the vessels capsular reconstruction margin size is immaterial as long as the final margin is negative prolonged ischemia time is anticipated then we go for extracorporeal approach so this is all about partial nephrectomy it can be done by lap or robotic open approaches these three approaches then we go for radical nephrectomy it is done for patient with increased oncological potential that is increased tumor size, adverse histology, adverse imaging features, good contralateral renal function with borderline EGF, EGFR predicted to be more than 45 ml per minute. Then tumor is non-functional in the non-functional kidney, large tumor replacing majority of parenchyma, renal vein thrombosis. These are the indications. Procedure is complete removal of the kidney outside the gerota fascia, axillateral adrenal gland, which may be sometimes required to remove, complete regional lymphadenectomy from crust of diaphragm up to the aortic bifurcation. Sometimes we also consider for pre-operative angioembolization in both uh, partial and radical nephrectomy. Again, we can go by robotic lap or open approaches. In open approach, you can go by flank incision. Ligation of renal artery is to be done before renal vein. Now coming to treatment of local advanced RCC. 
so if there is inferior vena cava involvement we can consider veno venous bypass or cardiopulmonary bypass if required also we may have to go for thrombectomy if there is surrounding tissue involvement t4 then complete end block removal with resection and in bulk lymph node we may go for lymph node dissection new adjuvant although the evidence is not very good can be tried in case of uh, severe disease and lastly metastatic disease where the solitary mets we go for extirpative surgery and palliative cytoreductive surgery if sometimes the tumor is too large and having obstructive symptoms and systemic therapy in the form of immunotherapy and target therapy so this was all about rcc hope it has been understood so keep studying keep growing because knowledge is power never give up because great things take time and please like share and subscribe the video and see you soon in next video thank you